In Europe, the Russians are rolling through Poland. Allied forces are mopping up in the Ardennes a salient. Day and night, fleets of bombers are laying waste to German cities. Similarly, their Axis allies, Japan, are retreating on all fronts. From the Pacific to Burma, civilians incinerated and left homeless by super fortresses. On the oceans, their navy was a shadow of its former self. It was clear to both Nazi Germany and Imperial Japan they were heading to inevitable defeat. It was also equally clear both forces were going to fight to the very last, not surrender. Far away from the fighting in New Zealand, the little bit about fight to the last had escaped the consciousness of the entire country. The war was winding down and it was getting back to normal. Dances were being held. War footing in the cities and provinces had largely faded away. Little wonder, therefore, when a Gisborne schoolboy rushed home one Monday evening after playing at the beach, excitedly exclaiming, There's a submarine in the harbour. His parents dismissed the sighting. It would take another 50 years and a lot of legwork by a Kiwi author to prove that indeed there was an enemy submarine lurking off the coast that evening, one harried out of Australian waters. U-boat 862 is now planning a nighttime raid on New Zealand shipping moored in Gisborne Harbour. U-862 was a long way from home, and home wasn't a base in Germany, rather Trondheim, Norway. You were looking at a photo of the sub departing on the 28th of May 1944 for the first leg of their patrol. In destination Penang in Japanese occupies Malay, a supply and logistics port for the German subs that formed the 33rd U-boat flotilla located in the region. Getting there in September. There's also a similar base in Netherlands East Indies, modern day Indonesia. U-862 would depart from what is now Jakarta, then Batavia, in December 1944 on her second and ultimately last mission. Here's a map courtesy of the Australian Navy to give you a quick overview of her travel south. How she ended up travelling down the east coast of New Zealand and why she was being harried out of Australian waters. You'll have doubtless spotted she had made a nuisance of herself there and would get on to do the same for the rest of her journey. Now to the sub itself. The Kriegs Marina built 1178 submarines that saw service in WW2. Type 7 with a garden variety, an upgrade of the standard World War One model. Of the entire fleet, 706 were Type 7s. The next most prolific type of German sub was what U862 was, the much larger Type 9. They were designed for sustained missions lasting months, not weeks. 193 Type 9s were put into service, 30 of those were the D2 variants. It wasn't until Japan entered the war, cities and towns took stock of their defences in view of a possible invasion. The Japanese threat was a sea, land and air one. The German threat was largely down to the odd errant radar laying mines and sending to bottom freighters they perchanced upon. An example of a freighter being sent to the bottom I've covered in this video. In the town of Gisborne, a battery went up on a Kaiti hill overlooking the harbour. That gun emplacement was manned 24-7. Pillboxes constructed, which are still there, last time I was there at least. Crude sandbagged bunkers surrounding the port and manned by home guards, the core of which were World War I veterans. There were no flies on these blokes. Dad's army, they weren't. 
the New Zealand Home Guard was a well-disciplined and capable force. What's more, subs and raiders beware, the Royal Air Force had a training base at what was then Darton Field, now Gisborne Airport, a reconnaissance squadron, the crew of which were alive trained in an aircraft like Vickers Vincent's on your screen, actively involved in coastal patrol work for a town of 12,000, it was packing. However, by the time the story starts, on the 15th of January 1945, complacency ruled. At that stage of the war, all those defences were gone, the barbed wire on the beaches had been rolled up, home guard wound down. Captain Trim and his crew of 57 needn't have worried as to what they may encounter in Gisborne Harbour. The gun emplacement now lay empty the gun itself having been removed. Sandbag bunkers similar. Air Force demobilised and the more modern Grumman Avengers that were there six months ago and their crew were now up in the Pacific. The government had declared the Home Guard superfluous since December 1943. Those local men were at home or in the pub. It was free pickings for the German sub, poised three kilometres away from the harbour entrance, ticking the minutes down to the wee smalls. Then, with just their coning tower above the water, and employing the almost silent electric engines, the slick massive craft moved slowly into the harbour. Scheiser. To the crew's horror, they found themselves at real risk of being grounded. Just one metre now lay between themselves and the harbour floor. With this, inadvertently, the crew got the closest any German would to setting foot in New Zealand's soil in World War II. For the record, no, they didn't go on to milk a cow, and then the story about wandering onshore in mid Canterbury is also BS. One thing the Germans were masters of was keeping meticulous records. Becoming a stranded was a risk not worth taking, especially since it was clear there were no targets worth expending one of the 30 torpedoes they carried on departing Indonesia. And just 30 minutes in, it was time to hightail it, retrace their course and exit the harbour before they scored an own goal or got spotted. This wasn't the first near escape for U-862, and let's keep in the back of our minds of the 1,178 subs built, I mentioned, 785 would be sunk. Therefore, there were plenty of ways to go to the bottom of the ocean. The first near miss for U-862, and to truly employ the term own goal again, happened in the Indian Ocean on the first leg, when they tried to sink a tanker. They found the swish new acoustic torpedo they had dispatched became a homing torpedo. Only a quick crash dive saved their skins. There was also the small matter of the Allies having long broken the German enigma. Any time they were on the airwaves, they were being compromised. Their sister ship, U-537, learned this the hard way, departing Batavia a few days earlier than 862. Having radioed their route, saw three US submarines waiting for her a day after departing and it was bye bye U-537. That sinking meant 862 was now the lone German U-boat operating in the Pacific sphere. U-862 was undoubtedly one of the lucky ones, surviving to surrender to the Japanese, assimilated into I-501, till that too surrendered in August 45, after which she was scuttled. All the crew got to see Germany again. Their survival owes much to the policy of keeping radio silence where pos. Back to the story and time for us to get our bearings. Gisborne had proved fruitless. A hundred miles south lay another major port, at least by New Zealand standards, Napier, where they would expend one of their precious stores of torpedoes. In case you're thinking, why not try Auckland? They had, earlier in the piece, they spotted a diddly, and they were now working their way down the east coast. 
Napier was equally defenceless, not that U862 was aware of that fact. Under the cover of darkness, and they could observe the beams of headlights of the cars buzzing between A and B, the illuminated portholes of vessels moored in Napier port, the glow and hum of a working wharf, music emanating from the town. And this was in stark contrast to what they encountered the night before. There was no way they could go undetected if they went closer to shore. It was simply a matter of waiting for one of those vessels being loaded to depart. They wouldn't have to wait long. The 742-ton coastal trader Pukeko sailed out of the harbour around midnight. A plump enough target. U862 lined her up and let rip. Waited for the explosion and then waited and waited and waited. It was another dud. A German souvenir that remains at the bottom of the Hawke's Bay to this day. And they weren't having a lot of luck. Perhaps that would change down in Wellington. Whether they would have sunk a vessel the next night or further south, say in Littleton, the port of Christchurch, is open to speculation. That's because on the southward journey between Napier and Wellington, they'd received orders from Germany to return to their Asian base. U862 travelled around the bottom of the South Island, waved goodbye to NZ on the 21st of January 1945. On that eventful return journey, U862 sunk the SS Peter Sylvester off the coast of Western Australia in killing 33. In civilian life before the war, Trim had gone down that coast as a captain of a merchant navy vessel, so this was familiar territory to him. That action on the 6th of February 1945 was the last time a German sub would fire a shot in the Pacific sphere. When you consider when New Zealand's major contribution to the Allied victory and Britain's survival came in the form of food and wool, with it the requirement to operate a large coastal and deep sea fleet, it was simply luck that saved one if not more of those vessels been sent to the bottom of the ocean by U-862 in January 1945. And the kicker here to end the story is... No one really knew the full story until New Zealand historian and author, the late Gerald Sean, dug his teeth into it long after the war, proved decades of old rumours were actually true travelled to Germany to meet the surviving crew and look through a Kriegsmarine records. What I've told you today is merely the skeleton bones, the skeletal story of a much larger one. If you want the full one, please grab a copy of his incredible book. Now if you're interested in more videos on Axis subs lurking around New Zealand in World War II, I'll leave you with the links in the description to the two related videos on that subject as well as a video I touched on earlier involving the only time two vessels have duped it out in the Tasman Sea. Thanks for popping by and getting so far into this today. Particularly if you are new to the joint, welcome aboard. Bye for now.